So you're going to move over? Yeah. Or you want to just leave? Yeah. You can leave here. I can stay here. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to just leave. Maybe somebody else will come in. Gee, thank you. I finally found on the Bible the other night I was reading. Remember that young, the black, dark-skinned guy came in? And he said he was preparing her for his burial when he anointed her. She had to put the oil on him. I found that in Mark where it was saying that. Wow. Not when she, but one, one book kind of goes over the same thing that the other ones do. They yeah, just they say they it do. a little different. Mm -hmm. Kingdom, and we're going to be talking about the prodigal son. I was hoping some others would show up. We had some tell us they were definitely going to be here Wednesday and ain't here, so hopefully everything's okay. There's still hope. <laughs> uh, if not, maybe they'll be here Sunday. That'd be awesome, too. So this is out of Luke chapter 15, and it's from verses 11 to 32. I'm going to read that, and then we'll... I've not been able to watch the videos. I've got to get my laptop fixed because for some reason it won't play the DVDs anymore. Well, none of them, which is kind of weird. But. So Luke chapter 15, verse 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Notice it was the younger son that asked that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance of riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a famine, or a mighty famine, in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and sent him, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Verse 17 says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with, with harlots, thou hast killed him, the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this day, or for this, thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You know, it's kind of sad because that's what happens today in churches. Somebody that's been out living the way they want to come back and get right with the Lord. Some people are like, huh, well, that ain't right. How are they back? You know, we can all be that way. We can all be that prodigal no matter what happens in our life. 
we have to be careful because it could be us. You never know. tried to establish himself in the world outside of the loving care of his father. I'm approaching an amazing set of ruins known as Susita on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. We're actually up on a plateau overlooking the entire lake below. It's taken me about an hour to hike back here. It's a site very rarely visited by travelers to Israel. In ancient times, when people would look across the lake and see these hills, they thought the contours of the hills looked like a horse's back. So in Greek, the town was named Hippos. In Aramaic, Susita, both of which mean horse. This side of the lake has always been Gentile, never Jewish. So it lived a life quite different from the small fishing towns down below. And this city was built, conquered, rebuilt, conquered again, but eventually suffered an earthquake from which it never fully recovered. When Jews thought about going to the far country, as the prodigal son does, they thought of Gentile lands like this. Here you find theaters, temples, pagan idols, pork, and scantily clad women. The prodigal son was looking to escape his past, his identity, his Jewishness. A place like Susita was perfect for that. It was foreign, dangerous, adventurous, the best way imaginable to thumb his nose in his father's ways. But in a cruel twist of fate, he was forced to face his identity, to face his Jewishness, as he had to take work as a pig farmer, feeding the most unclean animal a Jew could ever imagine. This is a tragic story, a beautiful story, the point of which would not have been lost on anyone listening as Jesus told it for the very first time. Two statues 
One is of a crusty old sailor guiding his ship out to do the fishing for the day. The other is of a mother and children forlornly looking out to sea because her husband is gone and may never come back. He might as well be in a far country, far, far away. The story of the prodigal son is a story of a different kind of going out to sea. It's a story of a young man who goes away to a far country and spends his inheritance very rapidly on wine, women, and song, and comes to the point in his life where he realizes he's made a tragic mistake. And the question is, will he be found the one who was lost? Will he come back the one who has gone away? There are three main characters in this parable. There is the father, there is the elder brother, and there is the younger brother. Now in this parable, each of these characters has an important role to play, but the elder brother does not show up till later in the parable. The essential exchange at the beginning of the parable is this. The young man, antsy to be out on his own and to do what he wants to do, goes to his father and demands his inheritance in advance, because in early Judaism, you don't get your inheritance till your father is dead. So he's shaming the father. He's saying to the father, you're as good as dead. Give me my inheritance now. I'll do with it what I please. I'm leaving. And the father grants his request. And this sets up the whole action of the parable itself. And so the young man goes away. He goes off to a far country, a Gentile one, an unclean country where he does unclean things with unclean people, eats unclean food, and quickly runs out of money, landing him in the most unclean spot for a Jewish person, in a pig parlor. Not hog heaven at all, the bottom of the barrel. And so desperate is he that he comes to the point of where he must eat the very food that even the pigs are eating. And so the sort of nexus of the story, the turning point of the story is this. We hear, and he came to himself. He came to himself. He came into his right mind and said, if I go back, my father will surely accept me. He can treat me like one of his hired hands. At least there I'll have room and board. At least there I'll have shelter and food. It'll be good again. But he's been gone for a long while, and technically speaking, he's got no right to ask for anything of his father. So you can hear him rehearsing in his head, what is he going to say when he sees his father, whom he had dissed, whom he had left for dead, who had gone away and taken his money and spent it. And yet, when his father sees him coming from a great distance, he runs out to meet him. He runs out to meet him. Rembrandt has a gorgeous painting of this. The father goes out to meet the son. The son falls at the father's feet. And the father's gentle and forgiving hands rest on the shoulders of the young man. And the young man repeats the speech that he imagines that he needed to say to his father. Father, I've shamed you family. I don't deserve to be treated as a son any longer. Treat me as one of your servants, one of your hired hands. And the father is so overjoyed to receive his youngest son back again that he decides to have an enormous party. And if the, the oldest son hears about all of this, and of course he's upset. <clears throat> he's troubled. He says in his heart of hearts, I've been with you all these years. I've never been unfaithful. I've never been untrue. I've never disobeyed the Torah. And you've never given me so much as a goat to celebrate with my friends. Now this man comes back, our younger brother, who had abandoned our family, and you kill the fatted calf. The father turns to the eldest son and says, Son, you are always with me. And now, Everything that I have is yours, but it's right, it's right to celebrate on this occasion. Because the one who was lost 
has now been found. The one who had gone away to a far country, never to be seen again, has miraculously returned. And so, indeed, the family rejoiced and celebrated. But you see, it's not just a human interest story about the trials and tribulations of an early Jewish family. It's a parable about the relationship of God to both his faithful children and his unfaithful one. And it, it paints for us the picture of a forgiving father, a father who is prepared, indeed willing to go out to those who will even make a step in the right direction and turn and be renewed and be restored. It's a parable about the character of God, the lostness of us, and the reaction of the loyal to when the lost becomes found. It's a story about how the least, the last, and the lost become once more the first, the most, and the found. And as such, it's the most powerful and familiar parable of all. Anybody learn anything from that that they probably didn't already know? Something different? No? You ready to move it off? You good to go? All right, we think we do. <laughs> Thinking in that culture, what did it mean to demand your inheritance? I wish about, the other guy was dead. Yeah, because you got to think about it. You can't get your inheritance unless your father is dead. And it I normally just... goes to the <laughs> eldest, not the youngest. Remember I, when I read that, I said, remember that. It goes totally against that tradition, that culture. Because it was the, the youngest son asking dead. for money. Kind of like when Esau sold his birthright to his younger brother for bread and a pottage of lentils. Back in those days, a birthright was a special honor that was given to the firstborn son. It included a double portion of the family's inheritance along with the honor of one day becoming the family leader. But the oldest son could sell his birthright or give it away if he chose, but in doing so, he would lose both material goods and his leadership position. Now that's the eldest, but this was, this story talks about it being the, the youngest. So it totally goes against. So in most cases, like we said, the money would be received at the father's death. The younger brother got it. This showed disregard for his father's authority as head of the family. Now, that, that's serious back in that culture in that day. But even today in the Middle East, it is regarded as disrespectful to ask for your inheritance if the father is still living. Even today. Even here sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we see it. I mean, you've seen it when a, when a person in the family had passed away and all the siblings or whatever come together to divide up the mm -hmm. man it destroys families mm -hmm. it is so sad of what it does so what think about it like this too now remember put yourself in this culture what did it mean for the father to run remember the bible said this parable it means to him, did the run father to him. ran to him in that culture what did that mean Anybody have a guess? That he forgives him? Well, what some theologians believe is that he ran to get to him before he entered the village. Because in that day and time, you shame not only your father, but you shame the village and everything that you're from. So basically, if you come back, they probably won't accept you or they can kill you. You know, when you shame your, your family's inheritance and your father and stuff like that, <clears throat> you're basically done. You know, you're not accepted back. So he probably ran in order to get to the son. Now the father runs, which shames himself 
When the father runs, it's shaming him. But he did this in an effort to get his son before the community got him. So that his son would not experience the shame and the humiliation of their taunting and their rejection. Anybody see a similarity in this story? What's that? Well, the father just, he, you know, he was so happy to see his son and he just forgot about what, what, had, what he had done and mm -hmm. then went to, um, to show him that he, you know, he loved him and he welcomed him. The father took the shame. The father took the humiliation. Right. Did anybody see a similarity somewhere? What did we just do last weekend? Yes, he died on the cross, but it was the son. What happened on Friday? Good Friday. Yeah, he died on the cross. He took our shame. Mm -hmm. Yes. He took our guilt. He took our humiliation. He took our taunting because he didn't want us to. You're, you're saying like he's our father. I was thinking when you say father, the, the father above Jesus. This is, this is a picture of us coming to Jesus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jesus is our father in this. Mm -hmm. And he took our place, our shame. He took yes. our guilt. He took all of our humiliation. So we wouldn't have to. Think about it. Parables always turn right back to the Lord. Now, what about the older brother's response to his return? <clears throat> well, that's human. His response. Jealousy. Jealousy. It's like the grandkids. If you give one a $10 bill and a birthday card, and you give them an $8 or something the next time, boy, they let you know. <laughs> <laughs> So it was hard for the older brother. So you got to see the difference here. The older brother wasn't looking for his brother to come back. He probably was glad he was gone. Now, did the older brother know that everything his father had when he died would be his? Oh, yeah. He knew that. Yeah, he knew that. Because he's like, because if you read the, the, the story there at the end, he's like, Father, I never left you. I was here. Yes. Kind of like, why would you give that and then there's one part in here that and he said verse 31 and he said unto him son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine he already knew everything he was going to have was there that didn't get given away What he, father just gave something else to the younger it is a difficult or it is as difficult today to accept younger brothers think about it like that we still have the same problem with accepting younger brothers today like that. We think they should get what they deserve. So should we. We can't forget that that could be us one day. And it was us at one time. People who repent after leading notoriously sinful lives are often held in suspicion. Most churches are often unwilling to accept them back. I've seen that. Yeah, and it's sad because Jesus says if we don't forgive he won't forgive us mm -hmm. and we're to forgive 70 times 7 to one person for one thing in one day that's what that example that Jesus said was basically what he said is we're to forgive <coughs> one time. never stop forgiving so what about the character of the father which in this case they say represents God in response to his son. What do, what do you think about his character? I thought it was great. Loving? Yes. Loving, That's forgiving, what loving, <laughs> father. And loving. Acceptable, and forgiving. Never even ridiculed him one time. Never yelled at him, where have you been? Why did you do this? It says that he ran and greeted him and hugged him and held him. Didn't he? I don't even think he heard a word that his son said. You know, because it doesn't really say that he responded to anything that his son said. In the first two verses of Luke 15, it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, 
This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Remember that culture, okay? Think about the situation that was surrounding Jesus' ministry at the time, and then Jesus tells this parable. He told several. He told the parable of the lost sheep, the coin, and then of the lost son. Tells that to these people that think that they're better and holier than anybody else. So who do the father and the younger son represent? Who knows? We just said that. Jesus God and us. Yeah. And us. <laughs> Why do you think the elder son in this parable is upset? We have said that. He was jealous. He thought the son did not deserve to come back. Plus, at that point, he's like, I've got it all. I'm the man now. My son, my brother's not here. I ain't got think about it like that. Think about what he was thinking. But what is Jesus trying to teach his listeners through this parable at this time about his ministry? What was he trying to teach them, these Pharisees and these people? What was he trying to teach them? I will take you back regardless. That nobody's better than somebody else. Be careful when you judge somebody and you look down on somebody. Because you got to remember at this time, the people he was with was the Pharisees and scribes. These were top-notch people that thought that they were holier than thou and nobody could touch them and they knew it all. Jesus was just trying to show. Because in this story, the father is portrayed as a very rich, powerful, important person. He had hired servants, you know. Not everybody had hired servants back then. He had all this stuff. So this was somebody of importance. And like I said, the, the son shaming him. Shame. The Bible says that every time that we sin, we crucify Jesus anew and bring him to open shame. And yet he takes us back every time. Think about it. There's a lot to this. We just got to realize it. is such 
that the young man has, in, in a sense, written himself out of the will. The father owes him nothing anymore. The fa family owes him nothing. And since he's dissed the family, the family has no obligation to take him back. They can treat him as if he were dead. That's the first part of the story. Now, the second part of the story, which, which helps us with understanding the elder brother's reaction, is that the elder brother, far from sort of being jealous of the younger brother, is sort of upset with the fact that the father has done this out of all order. He should be treating the loyal son more respectfully, and he should be consulting with him, and how shall we treat this refugee who's no longer a member of the family when he comes back begging for food? What should we do? Uh, but no, the father, with a forgiving heart, runs out to meet the son, maybe even outside the village, so there won't be a big hubbub in the village about the younger profligate son coming back to meet him. So we've got this legal situation boiling and boiling up through the parable. But how would it have been heard by the first audience? Clearly, it would have been heard that the elder brother represents Torah true Jews, the faithful ones, the synagogue attenders, the one that have all the synagogue pins on their toga for, from attending week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath. Uh, they were the stalwarts of early Judaism. They were the faithful, the, the, the proud, the ones who loved their heritage and, and would never dishonor their parents. That would be breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Well, then, who does the younger brother represent? He represents the very kind of people that Jesus went out to rescue, the so-called lost sheep of Israel, the least, the last, and the lost, the tax collectors, the sinners, the harlots, all kinds of people that would have been considered the great unwashed in that society, beyond the pale, lawbreakers. What kind of crazy father runs out to meet his son in an honor and shame culture? Well, he's shaming himself by doing that. How dare he do that? That breaks all the codes of honor and shame. We have to ask, and we'll talk about this later, what does this tell us about the character of God? that God is prepared to forgive even before we're ready to repent. What does it tell us about God? So when we come down to the end of this particular parable, there are a lot of dimensions boiling up underneath. And the story really hangs in the balance. Will the father accept the son? How will the elder brother react? And notice the profligate way the father reacts. He not only runs out to meet the son, on top of that, he says, bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf. Bring in the best caterer in town. Bring out the best wine from the wine cellar. We're partying down. But the parable is not just about how Jesus acted in his lifetime and how the Pharisees would have reacted or how the lost would have reacted and received him with gladness. It also implies something about the nature of the kingdom of God. After all, all of these parables are parables of the kingdom of God. And the phrase kingdom of God means the divine saving activity of God is breaking in, breaking barriers, breaking down walls so that anyone, anyone can be saved. Given that the younger son is shaming his father by asking for that inheritance, why do you think the father grants him his request? That's the love of a father. Anything else? Maybe he was wanting to learn a lesson. Probably knew he wasn't going to win by arguing with him. We don't know how the younger son acted before this. You know, this is a parable, but still, we don't know how if he was constantly nagging and begging and wanting. So what does that tell us about God? We keep uh, pursuing something. I keep wanting it. Wanting, he's going to finally let us. Yeah, let us have it. Yeah. Show us that we weren't supposed to have yeah. it. Yeah. God gives us free will 
and allows us to make our own choices. We are not robots, and he does not rule over us as a dictator. Free choice. Also, he knows the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, he knows what, uh, what we, you know, what people are. So a lot of people, a lot of theologians, which some of them are just as dumb that I'm learning in this class, they don't believe that God knows, like, what we're going to choose. They, some of them don't believe God knows everything. My God is all-knowing. He knows what we're going to do, but he's still going to accomplish his plan in our life. It may take a little longer. But he's going to allow us to do some things to show us, hey, that's what, not what you were supposed to do. Here's the reason why. Now come back. And let's, make, let's get some things straightened out here. Given that the younger son, son has shamed his father and the village, why do you think that the father accepted his son back, especially given that the first century context, the normal response to this action would have been excommunicating the son from the entire village. Why do you think the father took him back? Could? God would take you back regardless. Love. What's he done? It's all about love. You know, all about love. That's what it tells us about God. We've never gone, we'll never go too far that God can't bring us back. We've never done too much that he can stop loving us. It's his one of his attributes. He can't stop loving us. We are his creation. Now, granted, he got mad at his creation a couple times. Wanted to annihilate his creation a couple times. But because of some of his creation, he didn't. It's called love. It's unconditional. It is. Mm -hmm. So what does it tell us about our relationship with God, especially when we are prone to wonder? That we can always come back. Right. One step forward. <laughs> yep. I mean, we may, may have to get chastised a little bit. Maybe God may have to slap us a little bit, but he does that to those that he loves. That's what makes me wonder if he, this younger person, knew that he was offending the whole village. I didn't realize that at first, but if the whole village was offended because he left and took his father's inheritance Well, think about early. it from a spiritual perspective, since this is a parable. What do we do to our families when we're not doing right? When You're we're not living right? right? Okay, let's say that we're already in a church and we're part of a church and we start living wrong and doing wrong. We start shaming the church. We start. Why do you think Christianity has such a bad reputation? Because we all have our own sort of riotous living that we do and try to justify it. But it all boils down to verse 17 and when he came to himself until we've lived out the world and ourselves we're always going to go back to the world this son had to live it out and once he lived it out he came to himself and realized what he needed you know we all have children spouses brothers sisters that might not be living right or might not be where they should be with the Lord or might not be saved. It's not until they come to themselves. They come to that realization that they need God. That everything they've been doing is not working. It's not making them happy. It's not giving them peace. It only does it for a season. Then you got to do more. Then you got to have more. And it still doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, what that scripture with them. They said, teach them while they are young. It's in Proverbs. Train them up when they're a child. Yeah, so when they go astray. It, it, it never promises that they won't go astray. It just promises that they'll come back. Yeah, because they will remember. Yeah, that's in Proverbs. Solomon gives us that, that wise tale of wisdom there. Yeah. I 
we look at the last video here. synagogue attending people might suspect. God does not stand on protocol. God goes out and rescues the least, the last, and the lost. As did the Son, so is the character of the Father. This parable comes to life in a bigger way when we think about this as a parable of the very character of God. God is forgiving. God is restoring. God is renewing. He's reclaiming his children one by one. One who could be treated as a servant, God treats as a son. Well, this goes beyond grace. This is grace upon grace. You'll remember when Peter came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, how much should I forgive somebody? Seven times if they do me wrong? He's thinking, that's exceedingly generous. The number seven in early Judaism represented perfection. So he figures he's going on to perfection. And Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, an infinite number of times you should forgive them. And what's so telling about that particular saying is that Jesus is saying you should forgive him as much as Lamech in the Old Testament said he was going to take revenge. So just the opposite of the vengeful figure who's going to take revenge seven times 70 times on someone who's done them wrong. God is at the other end of the spectrum in the forgiveness that he's going to offer seven times 70 times. So this is certainly a parable about forgiving the Father. And so what we have here is a parable not just of forgiveness, but of the essential gracious character of God. God, the essence of who God is, is a God who wants to find a way to save a world it's out to sea. Now, the other dimension of this is, of course, that besides the offer of forgiveness, <clears throat> there also has to be the reception of forgiveness. Forgiveness offered is not the same as a restored life. And so we have in the Son a picture of repentance. Father, I don't deserve anything from you. I realize that whatever you give me will be pure grace. I don't deserve even to be treated like one of the better hired servants. Just treat me as a hired hand, not a member of the family. But God does see exceedingly abundantly more than they could have ever asked or expected. And so the prodigal is treated like the long lost son that he is. There's a big celebration, a messianic banquet, if you will. And what the picture of the kingdom that results is, that you're going to have very unexpected dinner guests at the Messianic banquet. You're going to have the in-laws and the outlaws. You're going to have the first, the most, and the found, and the least, the last, and the lost. You're going to have all different kinds of people, the clean and the unclean, men and women, those of high status, those of low status. To God, it doesn't matter. They're all creatures created in the image of God. And so whether they're Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, young or old, notable sinner, or notoriously famous for keeping the law. In any case, God wants them all to be restored and renewed into the new community of the kingdom of God. This is a parable that speaks to all of us, whether we stand with the elder brother as one who has basically kept God's word from day one, or we stand with those like the younger brother who have sowed our wild oats and have gone a cropper until God runs out and rescues us from our worst selves. Sometimes 
we get the image of the church that it, it's sort of a museum for saints. That's not true. It's actually intended to be a hospital for sick sinners. We have problems in the church. We have sinners in the church. Of course we do. And our obligation to them is to both call them to repentance and offer forgiveness. Not one without the other, but both. That's at the essence of who we ought to be if we're going to mirror the character of Jesus in this parable and the character of the Heavenly Father. Forgiveness has a bond with repentance such that the two go together. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, it's telling us that the character of God is such that he wants both holiness and forgiveness to be mirrored in our character, just as it's mirrored in his. There is a balance between justice and mercy, love and, and, and holiness that God calls us all to. We may come as we are to God, and God will graciously go out to embrace us. But God never leaves us where we are. He always wants to renew, restore, redeem, ransom us so that we may be all that God intended us to be. Let's focus again on that statue in Gloucester Harbor of the, the woman with her children forlornly looking out to sea. Think about how she must be feeling. Will he come back, whether it's her father or her husband or her brother or her son, and can just see, feel the emotion that's there. In a sense, it's an emblem of the father always yearning for his children to return. John 3.16 puts it this way. God desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting. And so you can take it as an emblem of the Father himself, but it's equally good as an emblem of the church, which should always be ready to embrace the lost. When they even appear on the horizon of our vision, we should run out to meet them, embrace them, and let them know that if they will be, but turn and be forgiven, they can be welcomed back into the bosom of the family of the church. Most folks here in New England are actually still on church registers. They've been baptized in the church. They go for special occasions like weddings. And most of them don't attend either. We as the church have an obligation, like that woman, to never give up hope on them. Because God hasn't given up hope on them. And God reaches them through us. As Mother Teresa says, God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our God is whispering in our ear, run, go out to meet them and embrace them so they can return. You can tell he's a northerner. <laughs> go on. Oh, go on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you can tell he's from up there. But uh, no, there's a lot of churches today that present themselves as museums. And it's funny how he said it, because like I said, I haven't had a chance to watch the video because I couldn't get it on my computer. But uh, Augustine Hippo looks at the church as a hospital. That's where we get healed. That's where we get saved. That's where we get strength. That's where we get renewed. God's church is considered, I've always looked at it as a, a, a version of America's Red Cross. You know, we come here to be healed, to, to be saved, to be freed. You know, this isn't a museum. You know, but there's a lot of churches that present themselves as we're holier than thou, and you got to do what we tell you. And I'm, that's not a church. Sorry. It's, it, we got to realize we are here to help those that need help. And you know there's still churches today, still today closed because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Scared to open back up. Do everything online because they don't want people being, I'm thinking to myself, they're going to answer for that. God's going to hold them accountable. Because his house is a house of healing, a house of prayer. 
We need to have it open. That's one reason we stay open. So how does this parable change your image of who God is and how he acts in the world? Did it? Did this parable, now that they've talked about it more in depth, kind of make you look at it a little different? He's not. He's still all powerful, but he don't just sit up there on the throne. Right. He's out seeking his children and, you know, wants to be with his children. Mm-hmm. I like the emblem he gave, which it's in y'all's, I think it's in your paper. I don't know if I copied that part or not. About what Mother Teresa said. God don't have hands, we are his hands. God don't yeah, have feet, we are his feet. Yeah. Yes. And then he's whispering, run, run to them. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're to do. And then we're to be there for one another. I like what he says that the woman with her children looking out at sea awaiting her husband is a powerful image of both of our Father God who waits for his wayward children to return to him and the church whose job it is to reach those wayward children. Listen, he's going he's gonna to hold a lot of churches accountable one day because the, that church didn't do what God commanded them to do. And you got to think about it. Do we think that the people in our church community are looking out to see for the lost? Do we think people in here, I hope people here, are looking out, wanting lost people to come in, um, wanting people to come in and know about God, and want people to get saved? There's a lot of churches that want to pick and choose who come in. You know, because if you don't look like them or act like them or make the kind of money they make, they don't want you. I'll take anybody. I mean, God took me. We all started somewhere. That's right. I mean, a perfect example how loving and accepting we are when Ron brings his group. I mean, society's point of view, they're different than we are. God's point of view, we're all the same. We have to be a better example for them. Right. They're coming hungry. They're coming wanting to learn, wanting to know about God. And we come, oh, it's Sunday. Sometimes, oh, we just walk in, it's ritual. It's a routine, I gotta go so I can show my neighbor I went to church. No. Instead of inviting your neighbor to church, we gotta go so they don't say, oh, hey, you didn't go today, your car stayed in the driveway. You know, we gotta make sure that we're doing this for God. Do we know anybody who's presently living in a far off land or in a distant country? No. We all do. Is all your family safe? Is all your children in church where they should be? Easter Sunday, hallelujah. All of my son's kids was in church and all their grandkids. Awesome. Now hopefully that keeps going, but I said that's a start. I mean, it's, it's proven. Easter is probably one of the biggest attendance in church, but they're hearing the word, hopefully. Hopefully the church they went to presents them the word. Well, most of mine have been in church all their life, but they just stepped aside right. and doing their own thing. And now that they've got little ones, I think they're realizing they have to teach them in the right way. That or the world's going to grab them. Yes. So we all know somebody that's living in a far off land. You know, gotta gotta bring them back. Have you given up hope that they will return to the waiting arms of the Father? You never give up hope. Never. Never. Faith, you know. Keep praying. Keep hoping. And don't give up. Listen. God said that he would give us the desires of our hearts. The problem is when we don't get it when we want it or the way we want it, we give up. Or we start doubting. When you doubt, you've given up. Remember that. Doubting is a sin. You're you're basically telling God you don't have the faith to believe that he can do what he's promised to do. He does not wish that anybody will perish. Not if you die. He says that. But those that go to hell, it's a choice. God didn't send them. 
Remember that. God doesn't send nobody to hell. We choose to go. I hope nobody in here is ever going to choose that. Because there's an excellent alternative. And that's heaven. You know, it has the best view of anywhere that we could ever have. Listen, God loves you more than you know. Because it's about God's amazing grace. And his grace changes everything. Everything. There's a lot about this story, about the prodigal. I mean, it, it's it could be us. It could have been one of us. Maybe it was one of us at one time. We never know. So next week, <coughs> Lord willing, we'll be in session four. The demand of the kingdom is what it's titled, and it's out of Matthew chapter 13. Verses 44 and 46. This is the treasure and pearls parable. Treasure and pearls. Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. The demand of the kingdom. Just two verses. 44 through 46 of Matthew chapter 13. That's what we will do next week. So read it if you would like. Get into it. Get in depth with it. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody have anything before we? Don't forget, Sunday morning, if you would like to come and pray with us, we pray at 915. Sunday school is at 10. Worship service is at 11. And again, at 4. We went to the revival Monday night and heard Brother Joe had an excellent time. We're going to try to go tomorrow and Friday night. So I'm just waiting on him to give me some dates. He's going to look for me and let me know so I can try to get him here one Sunday morning to preach for us. He did, did great on Monday. I took some notes. I think I'm going to do something with it. I'd like to take whatever, I mean, hey. It's God-given, so every message is not that preacher's message. It's from God, so we can use it and reuse it and add to it and do whatever that God tells us with it. So. Words don't fix it. That's right. That's right. We're going to see what God wants with it, hopefully. But uh, we got to work on it tomorrow, Lord willing. That's why it's a living word. He maybe gave Brother Joe Tolbert one message and gave you another. He did. He used Star Wars in his. I don't watch Star Wars. I don't really care. But he used Star Wars. And it, it was pretty interesting how he put it. And uh, hey, so he, he, he made the quote of, I, you couldn't get Star Wars out of the Bible. I said, I got Wizard of Oz out of the Bible. Come on. I read Wizard of Oz out of it. So trust me, you can get anything out of there because it's all about God in it. So uh, one thing to think about, and, and it's getting my attention because I had to just write a paper on it which what is your statement of faith what do you believe in think about that you don't have to answer it now I just want you to think about it because I don't think we really focus on what is it that we truly believe in <coughs> what do you believe in the doctrine of God the doctrine of Jesus the two parts of Jesus the flesh and the divine you know what what do you believe about the Holy Spirit what do you believe about the ordinances of the gospel, which is the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, washing the feet that we just did Sunday, uh, the Lord's Prayer. What do you believe in the sacraments of the Bible? What a lot of people just come to church, you know, we don't realize what is it that you truly believe in and why. That's why I really like to come to class because it gets broke down, stuff you can read that you don't understand, and then when we come here. And we see him and you, and whatever, it opens up our minds more. Yeah, I, I like to get into it because I don't want to just read it, you know. It, and I'm learning so much on how to interpret the Bible better and read it better. Um, but I had to do a statement of faith paper back when I first took the introduction to Christian theology that this is the principles of it that got a little more in depth. And this time I had to go a little more in depth with my statement of faith and back it up by scripture that changes things because you can say you believe this all you want 
find a scripture for it. That'll change it. And it, it'll make you look at, okay, i got to start backing up what I believe with this, not just what I've been taught my whole life. You see, I've always been taught that the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Show me. Show me in the Bible. It doesn't say that. It says, spare the rod, you hate your son. Total different than spoil and hate. And that's why I told people all the time, I tell you to go back and study. I'm going to do my very best to give you what God says and not my opinion. But I'll try to bring in my statement of faith. i got to read read over it had to be 12 at least 12 paragraphs long <laughs> and it broke it down to what what do i believe in the church what do i believe in the ordinances and, and i also went into our free will baptist treaties and book that we have and got a lot from there too because not every denomination believes you can lose your salvation some believe once saved always saved that's yeah. not in the bible either that's something I've been wanting to ask you. I've been to a lot of Baptist church, never a free will. What is the free will statement indicating? They, we believe Other than can, it is a choice. I mean, I know what free will right. is, but... The biggest difference is a free will Baptist believe you can lose your salvation. And the reasoning that is, is in Revelations, it clearly states that if you add to or take away, your name will be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name gets removed from the Lamb's Book of Life, you've lost your salvation. How, how are you going to go to heaven? How can you be saved? Mm -hmm. So how can you say once saved, always saved? That's where they go to the scripture that talks about where Jesus says that nothing can pluck you from my hand. That's fine. Yeah, that's true. Nothing can but you. You can choose to walk away, and I believe that. I believe because the Bible says that it's impossible to win those back that have already tasted the goodness of God or basically been enlightened. I, that was one of the things in my statement of faith that I put and I backed it up with those scriptures because I know my uh, professor is going to be totally against it. And I also put on there that there is a hell and there's a literal hell and this is why he don't believe in hell either. My, the, my, my professor don't believe there's a literal hell. And another question I have, you know where it says you can be forgiven for everything but if you go against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin. So what, like if I, if somebody that doesn't know uh, that the Holy Holy Spirit even exists and, and says so, is that blasphemy? I have no idea. I don't study that because I don't want nothing to do with it. I try because to keep then that part my next thing <laughs> is if you ask, finally when you learn there is, <laughs> now I get off your <laughs> and you ask for forgiveness. <clears throat> Because you said you didn't think there was a Holy Spirit. But you find out when he enters you, there is. <laughs> Listen, if the Holy Spirit's drawing you, then you ain't reached that point. Okay, if God's still drawing at that person, they have not crossed over that point of no return. That's why I look at the Bible. <laughs> the Bible says the Spirit will not always strive with man. So there comes a point. In somebody's life that they can walk away so far from God for so long that God says okay or blaspheme of the Holy Spirit and hope they leave but if you still feel like God's talking to you and call, then you, you're, you're okay that's the biggest thing and a lot of people are like oh I don't believe I believe once saved all well, okay I believe that to a point if you're living your life to the best that you can and you're trying to stay as close to God you're gonna be fine okay but if you think, I got saved, I can go live back in the world like the prodigal, however I want, then you, one, probably never really got saved. Or two, you just chose to walk away. I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it to the test. That's my thing, is don't play around with that, because it's, it's not something to play around with, because eternity is a long time to be wrong. Yeah. There's no do-over. Yeah. You can come at any time. Yes, and there's no do-over. We're only one heartbeat away from eternity. So we got to think about that, but... Yeah, I'll try to bring that in once I'm done with it and read it to you so you can see what my statement of faith is. But I want you all to think about that because somebody's going to ask you one day, why do you believe something? You better be able to back it up with something out of here. Don't believe something because somebody said it. Okay? Why do you believe it? Well, let me show you in the Word of God. You might not know exactly where it's at, but trust me, Google helps. I'm learning that. I can go up there and Google and put KJV verse and just a couple words what I think. Boom, it pops up. Oh, there's there. There it is. Before Google, I had Strong's Concordance. 
<laughs> when um when, when I first when the Lord called me, I been you know raped in church, and um as He was talking to me, you know, He He showed me some scripture how to go about my my growing in Him, and the one that um He it says John. Ephesians and Titus. Mm -hmm. So when he told me Titus, that really, really put some, because he said, you got some seat surges out here that knows the Bible, but you have to know, just like you said, you know how to prove it. Mm -hmm. So in Titus, I, I didn't know that until the Holy Spirit brought it to me. And I'm like, wow. A lot of good stuff in Titus. A lot of good stuff. All hearts and minds clear? All right. Well, Lord, we just want to thank you and allowing us to be here tonight, Lord. And for, Lord, I want to thank you for the parable that you've given on the prodigal because that is just us totally. You, you basically talked about us when you talked to the Pharisees. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that that we can all come to ourselves and that you will run to us and will forgive us and love us and accept us just how we are. And Lord, we love you for that. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless us tonight. Keep us safe as we leave here. Bring us back to the next appointed time, Lord. And please be with all those in our church and all the prayer requests that have been asked. And we ask, Lord, that you'll just help this church to continue to grow and that souls will be saved, Lord. In your precious holy name we pray. Mm -hmm. Did any of the kids find the money eggs?